Okay, this is actually a historic night <laughs> because Mike and I have not seen each other since 2016. Yep. We're the co-founders of WordPress, and Dries is the founder of Drupal. Uh, so, and the three of us have never been in the same place at the same time ever before in the history of the world. First time, yeah. <laughs> so you are all seeing something very exciting, and I, I'm actually really excited as well because <laughs> I, I, uh, uh, so one thing is that like I love Drupal, <laughs> like it's one thing that connects us all. I always tell people when they say like uh, you're the WordPress guy, right? You know, like, but I'm like no. I'm actually the open source guy. Um, I think open source is the most powerful idea of our generation. And um, I was so lucky to be exposed to it at a young age. And as a teenager, I discovered open source. And I thought, wow, this seems like a way that we can work on things. We can all work together. And then like we collaborate, humanity gets better. And it's great, sure. Um, and I was very lucky that some of my most generative years were able to be dedicated to open source because, uh, yeah, <laughs> probably because I stumbled across some like Richard Stallman essay or something. So that's actually where I wanted to start because I'm curious for each of you gentlemen, I'm going to ask you, how did you get radicalized <laughs> <laughs> uh, into believing that open source was the way to build software? Uh, okay, so for me, um, it definitely was a Richard Stallman essay. Huh. So it was it was his story of uh, working in the universities, and he, he was kind of, I think he was studying at the time when things like printer drivers for computers were were um, were all open source because the hardware was the thing that made people money. And then when he got his job in in the, the academic world. Um, the, the the whole thing had changed and and licenses were were being issued and people couldn't share code and and things like that um and yeah his his thought processes around that uh just just gelled with me with something that i'd um always kind of thought about uh and and funnily enough uh <laughs> i was on a podcast sometime last year um and one of the things i was asked about was influencers and star trek believe it or not is an influence that um, sci-fi world where everybody helps each other and everything's kind of open and collaboration is the is the way that things get done that was something so so his thoughts was something that, that struck me um, and yeah that was my start into yeah learning what was open source before it was termed open source um, and bizarrely that was actually before I was on the internet so that was something that I learned about uh, using um, bulletin board systems with a dial-up modem very long time ago, the 80s. <laughs> Mike and I had lunch today. I actually, Mike is so youthful, I didn't realize <laughs> that um, when WordPress started, I was 19, you were 41. Yep. I didn't know that. <laughs> um, at, Which makes me At the time, <laughs> uh, I was, uh, I used, I didn't use my photomat handle. I used like a handle called uh, illusion because I was trying to hide the fact that I was like a kid who didn't know anything in Houston, <laughs> but that was what was kind of cool yeah. was that on these online communities, mm -hmm. it didn't matter if you were a kid in Houston who didn't have a college degree or anything. Absolutely. We connected yeah. on code yeah, yeah, and based on the basis of our work and like, uh, you know, from across the ocean we had never met before um so that was kind of how that whole thing kicked off how about you do you remember what from your childhood might have led you to be more open sourcey mm. so i by the way i didn't know i was going to be here until two hours ago <laughs> and i didn't know i was going to be in stage until 10 minutes ago <laughs> So, um, <laughs> Dries gets the champion award for being like a good sport. <laughs> <laughs> Participation medal. Yes. Um, so I was a student in computer science. I was 18, I think, and I was using Linux. Oh. I don't know how I learned about Linux. I think through friends. Um, one of my best friends, he was living across the street from me. And he was one of the first 10 people to get high-speed internet in the city that I was living in. 
And I remember he had to sign this contract, you shall not share your internet with other people. And I was like, yes, we're sharing this. <laughs> <laughs> and so we tried to figure out how to kind of build a wireless bridge. And I remember actually contacting Alcatel Lucent at the time and they said, yeah, it's possible it's going to be like $100,000. <laughs> yeah, this was early days mm -hmm. of you know wireless technology. And so I ended up searching and searching and eventually found a little company in the UK. I forgot the name, and they were among the first people or to build these um, PCI uh, Wi-Fi cards, WLAN cards, they were called back then. Remember, mm -hmm. you had to like, slide them in the back of your PC. So I was using Linux, and so I'm like, all right, now I have to get this thing working. And so it ended up that I um, started uh, making small contributions to the Linux kernel to get fast internet. And it's how I kind of fell in love with open source even more. And wow, so yeah. your first contributions were to the Linux kernel. Yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> do you remember your first? <laughs> that's, that's impressive. That's, that's right. why do you remember your first, so which hard first contributions? Use, you know, uh, probably, probably MySQL. Um, My, oh, wow. Maybe CVS. Actually, no. The 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 one that became, came in between CVS and Subversion. So Subversion came out of a rewrite of something that was a rewrite of CVS. I don't remember that middle thing. I mean, either. It, I, it was still called CVS, but I think it was Win CVS. Huh. So, um, and that was a, yeah, that was a whole interesting thing because um, basically the, uh, what's he called? Fogel, the guy behind CVS. Didn't Carl Fogel. Want, yeah. Yeah. Didn't want to uh, rewrite it for Windows. And so some guy who was new to the scene just came in and said, well, I'm going to do that. And he rewrote the whole thing and got it working on Windows. Huh. And um, eventually that became the CVS that everybody used. And then eventually Fogel came along and said, yeah, but, and wrote Subversion. <laughs> ah. But yeah, Subversion and I think uh, uh, CVS and MySQL were my first contributions. For me, I think it was probably actually uh, B2 oh. was my first uh, contributions. Um, so my my path was definitely just like I was just a kid on the internet, you know, <laughs> like hacking around on forums, hanging out. Mm -hmm. And... Um, uh, it was so cool because um, in Houston, I was uh, mostly studying jazz and economics and didn't have a lot of folks I knew that were as into computers and the internet as I was. <laughs> so it was like every time I logged on, you know, <laughs> the dial up and everything like that, uh, it felt like I was connecting to my people, my tribe. And it was amazing that from across the world, literally across the ocean, we had never met. Yeah. Um, and blogs were a big part of that. We've all been blogging for a really long time. <laughs> I think my first uh, contribution was actually, uh, you remember Texturize? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, Texturize was, um, the tagline was, so good it'll make your quotes curl. <laughs> so I, I at the time, I had studied, uh, I found typography. Like, typography was really cool. Um, last time Dries and I saw each other was actually at the Gutenberg Museum. <laughs> That's right, yeah. In Antwerp, right? Yeah, in Antwerp, uh, there is a museum and they have some of the, old, the oldest printing presses in the world, which is quite special. So it's where they really, I invited Matt to it. I'm from Antwerp um, because that museum, that place, that house, um, was basically responsible for most of the print production in, I don't even know what, what years, but it was really kind of where print went mainstream. And I figured it would be, I figured it would be special because, you know, both of us have helped take digital publishing kind of mainstream in a way. And so I figured it's a nice little visit. So, yeah. Typography, yeah, there's a whole science of it. Um, there's a, Matthew Butterick actually writes some really great books on this if you want to look it up later. But, um, I learned that like the the button on your keyboard is not actually an apostrophe; it's a single prime mark, <laughs> and the double prime mark is not a quote. And so, you know, the quotes would be curled. And in HTML, to do this, you'd have to write like you're writing there. You write T H E Y uh, ampersand hashtag <laughs> eight two one seven semicolon uh, R E. <laughs> and so I was just. I started doing that while I was writing all my blog posts because I wanted to have the proper, ty proper typographical things, uh, things. And um, I was telling my dad how frustrating this was. 
And he said, oh, you should check out regular expressions. <laughs> and as the old joke goes, like, then you have two problems. <laughs> <laughs> and so I learned regular expressions and through the Pearl book. And I think he got me the Camel book from mm -hmm. O'Reilly and everything. And like, it totally blew my mind. So I started trying to craft some regular expressions that could parse the text and like automatically enhance the typography. And um, uh, it was accepted into the code base of B2. Yeah, yeah. And um, it like literally blew my mind that like code I had written with my hands was running hundreds of times <laughs> per day <laughs> somewhere in the world. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, for me, yeah, those those contributions that that knowing that you are making a small part of the world a little bit better has always been something that's that's been important to me um, in whatever whatever way I can. Um, and so yeah. Uh, the, the contributions that, that we did, the way we, we forked B2 and, and started WordPress. That's always been special to me, really has. Um, I've been thinking a lot about um, evolution. We are all here because of evolution, and it's kind of the most incredible thing when you imagine that many, many billions of years ago, there was like a single cell, and now we're all here, and there's paintings on the wall, and lights, and electricity, and water, like all these, all these sorts of things. Like that happened kind of like one chain set at a time over many, many billions of years. And um, DNA is like source code, mm -hmm. effectively. Um, it has the four freedoms. <laughs> Do you all know what the four freedoms of the GPL are? So uh, Drupal is GPL too, right? Yeah, so one common thing between WordPress and Drupal is that we adopted a GPL license. And um, so this was one of the things that radicalized me was this idea of not, not copyright, but copyleft. So uh, normally when you download software, uh, it comes with a list of all the things you can't do, all the restrictions, right? But as more and more of our digital lives are governed by software, algorithms choose where we go, who we date, <laughs> what restaurant we go to, all these sorts of things. Um, who's ever read the like EULA end user license agreement when you like sign up for iTunes or Apple or like? Yeah. Once or twice. <laughs> hey, on WordPress.com, we actually put an Easter egg in it. <laughs> so if you read the WordPress.com one, you get some barbecue. <laughs> some barbecue hidden in there, um, uh, a little brisket. So just because I knew no one ever read it. <laughs> Uh, but on the opposite side, what open source does, GPL in particular, gives you freedoms and rights. Mm -hmm. And so as we are all trying to create a more free society, give more human, I, I believe like a fundamental human right is the four freedoms of open source, which is the freedom uh, to use the software for any purpose, mm -hmm. the freedom to see how the software works, the freedom to modify the software, and the freedom to redistribute those modifications. So if you have those four things, that's kind of like a bill of rights for software. And so as our lives, as we start to program our digital lives, like it's so important that all of the software that we use and interact with has those freedoms embedded. Because if it doesn't, we are removing our agency, we're removing our freedom. And that's not the world I want future generations to grow up in. Like I, I want to build a world where like we get more free, more agency, more autonomy. Mm -hmm. And I feel like that's very like open source people are very different. Yes. <laughs> it's actually yes. one of the beautiful things. And Drupal has, by the way, Drupal has one of the most beautiful open source communities in the world. Like it's really astonishing what you all built on Drupal.org. By the way, I, I meant to look at my user number there. I think I'm in the first thousand. Oh, uh, really? Nice. Uh, yeah. Nice. <laughs> on drop.org? Drop yeah, drop.org. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> so actually, that's maybe a quick, fun anecdote. So as I was contributing to Linux, I started getting into PHP and my SQL. I just wanted to spend a couple of nights building a message board, actually, once I got my friends up and running, or once I got up and running on my friend's <laughs> internet. And... I, f I finished college, I moved out, I moved my intranet to the public web and that became drop.org oh. and drop.org was kind of my original blog and that attracted people interested in the future of the web they started suggesting um, improvements to make to my website and then i decided to open source the software behind my website and what i did is i literally just copied the gpl from the linux kernel tree 
as I was contributing to Linux, mm -hmm. into my website, created a tarball or like a zip file, and uploaded that to Drop.org, thinking 10 people might even like download that and use it. Uh -huh. And so that's how Drupal was born. And, I, and the GPL literally just came from the Linux kernel tree. Yeah. That's beautiful. Yeah. So like yeah, that's absolutely. that's evolution. It's evolution, <laughs> yeah. right? Um, one of the most beautiful things I've seen. It, it actually like like Michelangelo's David. Like it drew me to tears as I saw a picture of a phylogenetic tree, which showed you know sort of the evolution of different things and different branches. And like um, it's beautiful. Like open source does that. Actually, when uh, WordPress started, yeah, um, we were born out of a project called B two. Yeah which a lot of people don't know, it's called B2 Cafe Log. And there were like four or five different forks of B2. Mm -hmm. So yeah. it kind of uh, died. And um, or the basically it was maintained by one person. He had a personal issue. He kind of disappeared <coughs> from the internet. And um, there were four or five forks that started. Mm -hmm. And yeah. ours was just one of them. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> but yeah. that was kind of beautiful. That was like we were the different branches yeah. that kind of evolved out of this uh, mm -hmm. tree. What? And so, if y'all don't know, is it the twenty seventh? By the way, is going to be the twentieth anniversary of WordPress. Mm -hmm. Can you believe it? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Twenty yeah, twenty years since the first release. Yeah, absolutely. There's another date we celebrate. I forget it. I think it's in May. Yeah. Uh, no, in January. There's a was it January twenty fifth? Is the comment that when I you left the comment. Yes. So we call that the conception. <laughs> when, then it gets messy if we want to take that any further. That's when the idea was born. So that the release was made. Yeah, I did. A, I did a blog post where I said I called it "blogging software dilemma" because there were there's different blog software out there. There was a text pattern, movable type, uh, Blogger, Live Journal. There's a lot of good things out there, but none of them have like Drupal. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> none of them had exactly the things. Actually, that is a good question. Why didn't I? I don't know. Well, we're yeah. not we're not known as a blogging platform, so maybe that's why. <laughs> that might have been it, actually. Yeah, yeah. Um, it might have been more of the blogging and comedy features mm -hmm. at that time. You didn't, you could do it now, but like at the time, um, and I was like, so I was looking at these four things, and I was like, none of them quite does it. Wouldn't it be cool if something took the best from all of these? And Mike left a comment mm -hmm. and said, "Hey, if you're interested in working on this, yeah." I'd be interested in working on it too. Yeah, absolutely. And that was kind of the the spark from that comment, which is still there. Yeah, <laughs> we yes, can like yeah. trace it all the way back to the the timestamp and everything. Um, we started collaborating on what mm -hmm. would later become. Didn't even have a name at that point. No, no. Um, no. We were both kind of volunteers on the B two forums. That's I think right. I'd even gotten commit actually. Yeah. Oh, uh, that's right. Yeah, yeah. On yeah, SourceForge. Yeah, yeah SourceForge. That's um, right. <laughs> and uh, yeah, that became WordPress. Mm -hmm. Life changing comment. Yeah, absolutely. Um, and I think what's interesting is that the the very next comment on that blog post is a year later, celebrating the anniversary. So nobody else commented. Yeah. <laughs> it actually shows you the power of a single comment. Mm -hmm. uh, like never underestimates uh, the power of reaching out across the internet. And that's kind of what I what I love about us becoming more and more connected through the internet. Mm, yeah. And as more and more humanity gets like always on connectivity like that just feels good mm -hmm. because all of the things that um you know the illusion of separation is perhaps like the biggest tragedy of society like that we're all separate we're all actually connected anything that connects us more and more is a good thing um i'm trying to think where we should go from here like so open source i can i can add something that's maybe of interest so because you were talking about the four um you know, principles or four rights of open source or the GPL in particular. And so in essence, open source is a license, right? It's mm -hmm. a legal document that describes what rights you have when you yep. use a software. But the beauty is that those freedoms or those four freedoms, they lead to collaboration. And that collaboration leads to community. Mm -hmm. And that community leads to like innovation, mass innovation. And so while it's a license on one hand, it's also like a way of being, a way of collaborating and innovating in the world. And so open source is both of these things, for me at least, mm -hmm. you know? And I think the other thing to talk a little bit more about evolution that came to mind is like how open source is almost Darwinian. Yeah. If you think about how Corporations innovate. They have 100 engineers, and they have to be very specific about what they're going to work on to maximize the output. 
And so let's say, you know, both WordPress and Drupal, we have, let's say, um, a photo album, you know, plugin or module. Mm -hmm. And in fact, we probably have 30, right? <laughs> <laughs> Versus if you're a company, it would be crazy to develop 30 photo modules yeah. um, or plugins. It would just be insane. You would never do that. You would have like one and you would try your best to make it the best one you can ever build. But the beauty about open source is you have all of these people that can contribute their own version and even fork existing versions mm -hmm. to make it better. And eventually, just like evolution and their in, in you know Darwinian evolution, sort of the best solutions bubble to the top and bad solutions tend to disappear. And it's a great way of innovating, you know? Yeah. It's sort of it's it's a beautiful way of innovating. It's open market yeah. in a lot of ways. And uh, a meritocracy of ideas can happen. Um, that's why I've never, uh, like Drupal and WordPress, I've never had beef. <laughs> <laughs> Ever. Uh, we've beefed with proprietary software before uh, when they've stolen our code, yeah. like <laughs> Ricks uh, or uh, <laughs> other things. But um, yeah, to me, I just want more open source in the world. Like that is my life's work. Like I hope to contribute to open source the rest of my life and create more of it because it feels like, you know, now with the language and communication, uh, evolution is now happening at a mimetic level. It's happening at ideas yeah. and, and language and words. And so we don't have to wait for generations to die and mutate. It can happen when like you could hear something tonight that could change your life and could change your course. Um, just like, all of us did when you left that comment or when we first read that first open source essay that got us mm -hmm. like, yeah. you know, thinking this is the, what we want to spend our time on versus like making proprietary software. So you never underestimate the power of a single idea. And that is, I think, where um, I, I really want to get this message out more because uh, I think we need sort of a new... Um, it's interesting. So I think that proprietary software, you've probably seen this a million times on the Acquia side, like uh, all the media companies that were like, we need to build our own CMSs. <laughs> they can make something that's like a little bit better for them for a little bit. But then, so the graph kind of goes like this, it's better than open source. Then open source just kind of goes like this, better, 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 better. It's like, it's like Wikipedia versus Encyclopedia Britannica, mm -hmm. right? Yep. The first version of Wikipedia sucked. It was not good, but incrementally got better better, better, better every single day. And the collective uh, contributions of humanity allows us to now evolve at the speed of communication yeah. versus the speed of, you know, reproduction, mm -hmm. which is pretty exciting. Yeah, yeah. Okay. And now with AI, it's oh, yeah. maybe <laughs> getting faster, <laughs> the singularity and everything. We've got like five minutes, 10 more minutes. Yeah, yeah let's open yeah, up sure. the audience. Yeah, yeah. Um, I'm gonna. This isn't. This is on. Does anyone have a question? Here. Hey, thanks, man. Hey, I'm Pete. Um, I just wanted. To, it's a bit of an open question. Um, I worked at Creative Commons um, back in the day, and um, I remember that we worked really closely with Movable Type and and those kinds of guys. At the time, I remember there was a lot of confusion about. Um, WordPress and its longevity and how it was going to make money and survive and, and so on. Apart from the open source thing, honestly, how do you guys think that WordPress has dominated in the way that it has against some fairly well-funded commercial uh, competitors? Hmm. So what I'll say is that you want to pick the right branch on the evolutionary tree. <laughs> so you want something like a Drupal or a WordPress that has, looks like it's, it's got legs that it's going to be fit in the open market. It's going to like it's not a flightless bird in New Zealand. It's like a, a cockroach or something that's <laughs> going to like survive, outlast us all. <laughs> um, so that's part of the reasons why I I I consider all proprietary software to be evolutionary dead end, like literally. I know that's a very bold statement, <laughs> but I think over time, and that time might be hundreds of years. Um, Proprietary software just goes away because there's no way that something in a closed ecosystem can out. None of us as smart as all of us, right? No company is as smart as humanity. And so 
I think that's to the extent that open source projects get that flywheel effect. They get more users, they get better, and then they get more users and then they get better. Um, that's it. But I will say one thing that I think we all have realized, uh, which is that um, all the ph philosophy we've talked about, like we're in this beautiful hall, like I, I know we've been a little philosophical. Um, Definitely, like I would say, to the extent that our projects have been successful, it's been because uh, we realized that not everyone cares about that philosophy. Yeah, you know, like sure. <laughs> that it's cool that Richard Stallman plays this flute and everything like that. But like, you know, I believe that, and I would love all of y'all to believe that. But we're never going to reach seven billion people with that. So at the end of the day, you have to make the best user experience. Mm -hmm. And so that's kind of why we started working really hard on that. It's like, okay, I I want this to be the future. I want future generations to grow up in a, in a web that's more open, that has like an open source framework at its core, not something proprietary. So if that to be true, we have to make the best product. Yeah. Because <laughs> that's what people want at the end of the day. Like people don't want to drill, they want a hole in a wall. Um, you need to make the best user experience. And that is, I think, what's been uh, really beautiful about kind of our generation of open source. Because prior to us, open source was much more developer facing. Definitely, more about yeah. like ages, you know, databases and stuff, and now it's more uh, consumer facing. It's embedded in every all of our lives. I think uh, one of the key things about WordPress that made it um, do what it did was that it was easy to access. It was easy to get started, both in terms of using, and that was one of the aims was to make it as usable as we could. But also from a developer point of view, it was easy for new developers to dip the toes in it. Um, and that gave that effect of lots of people being able to contribute and lots of different ideas. And yes, some of them were terrible, uh, but some of them were great. And a across a lot of people who had easy access to start coding in WordPress, we ended up with a, with a whole bunch of really good uh, increases in, in, in uh, functionality and ease of use and so on. And, and we're still headed in that direction. Ease of use is, is still key. Earlier today, you showed me a uh, across where you buy groceries. There was oh, a, yeah, yeah. a building that has a was it beams that were seven hundred years old. Yeah, yeah. And you know what I actually thought of was like, is a line of code that we wrote still going to be running in seven hundred years somewhere <laughs> in some <laughs> emulation or something? Yeah. I think we have time for one more, maybe two. <laughs> All right. That would be pretty cool. Right? Again, that, would, that would be pretty cool. Yeah, like yeah. some line of code was running. Still somewhere. some original lines of Drupal in Drupal, but yeah. <laughs> not much, I think. Yeah. Hey, I'm Stefan. Software has been basically built the same way since like 30, 40 years. But do you think there's a change now? How do you see software being written or built in the next five or 20, 10 or twenty years? Is there a big change coming in, in for the? I feel like it has changed so much. Good answer this, especially with the AI stuff. Like how yeah. is AI transforming how we Everything. write software? So yeah, we can literally go to ChatGPT today and and say write a Drupal module, and I'm sure you can do the same for WordPress. Mm -hmm. Write a plugin that does this and this, and it will literally like write code that works. Um, so that's definitely changing the developer experience dramatically. Uh, Lots of questions about the generated codes, you know, mm -hmm. what licenses, I mean, all the things. But like, it's very obvious that the recent evolution in AI is going to be game changing to software. It's like, you know, sometimes innovation jumps an S curve. Mm -hmm. It feels like an S curve jump to me. Yeah, yeah, I'd, I'd agree. It's, uh, yeah, it's it's still got some way to go, but just just the rate of acceleration is is astonishing, um, and. Yeah, maybe we'll we'll get the current or the next generation of AI will be generating the follow-on generation, um, or at least tools around it. Um, so yeah, I think it is going to change. I don't think anybody knows or can confidently predict how it's going to change, but I do think it is going to change. Yeah, and I do I do think the way there's like these long-running trends. I think like you know when we started building websites, we probably wrote them in notepads and used FTP to upload our sites or something. And then CMSs came you know, in, into the world. And, and I think there's been this 20 year trend towards like low code, no code, yeah. where you go from writing every single line of code to a lot of people I talk to, they don't write that much code anymore to build powerful. And, and so that's a way of 
programming, if you want to think about it, like you know, just building things through the UI, like through Gutenberg and and those kinds of solutions. So, did you see the GPT four demo from Greg Brock Brockman? I did not know. It was a little wild. So Greg Brockman, I think the CTO of OpenAI, part of the demo of GPT four, which is multimodal, so it can do images and things like that, is he uh, takes a piece of paper, he draws a website. <laughs> Takes a photo on his phone, and then sends it to GPT-4, and then it codes the website. And I was like, that was my life's work. <laughs> they just did that in like 20 seconds. What just happened? I did see that, yeah. Um, that amazing. So it's kind of wild. Uh, but I, the, these trends are complementary. So, um, you know, if you're, if you're going to remember something that I said 20 years from now, it's that open source and AI are the two mega trends of the next 20 years. And... The reason they're complementary is that GPT-4 hasn't read Shopify's code. <laughs> it's yeah. read Drupal's code, mm -hmm. WordPress's code, and all 55,000 plugins and everything else. So it can write it. Mm -hmm. And if you ask it to write a website, it's going to write it in an open source thing. It's gonna, not going to write it in these proprietary things. So again, from an evolutionary point of view, I actually think if you go far enough in the future, someday we'll see... Um, even the propri our proprietary competitors, the Wixes and Squarespace and Shopify's of the world, actually running on open source software. I would, and that's part of our vision with Gutenberg as well. Why we made it actually an even more permissive license than uh, the GPL. We put it under, we dual license under the MPL, so it, it could be embedded in commercial applications. Because I really think it's so important that I want it to be even in commercial applications. Cool. I think that does it for time. Maybe. Um, Oh, everybody, please join me in thanking the group here. <laughs>